thought you had all the announcements, more are given. So here we go. We would like to welcome everyone here to University Church of Christ. We ask uh, members and visitors to fill out a card, and we ask members, stick around afterwards. Let us get to know you. Uh, there is a lot of things going on here, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of information that we're not going to announce this morning. Read your bulletin and, uh, and go from there. Um, Boy Scouts, Troop 4 have pumpkins for sale and roses. The house on 38, just north of the church building, $3 a piece. Uh, also, <clears throat> Bill Floyd was put in hospice and is very, is very ill, so keep that family in your prayers. We also need desserts for the Monday, Monday lunch. Roy Tennant, uncle of Pat, Mickey, and Randy Abbott, and Frida Gist passed away on Friday <clears throat> in San Antonio. And the ladies' Bible class and all ladies here at the at the church are invited to Danny Beth Prock's house for a brown bag lunch Friday at 1030. Come and join us for a wonderful fellowship. The address is 149 North Timber Creek Circle. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for the gift of your son. We thank you for his church and the blessings that that gives us. And we ask you to bless this family today as we come before you to, to honor and to praise you. And we pray that it is done in a way that's acceptable to you. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Job had everything, and with God's permission, Satan systematically took, took it all. Uh, his wealth, his family, his health, even the love of his wife. And Job argues with God. He interrogates God. He wrestles with God, but he never curses God. He never gives up either his faith or his hope. Because Job recognizes that God is ultimate. And when you get to the end of the book, he recognizes that even in a more direct and powerful way. But God is ultimate. And beyond the pain, beyond the suffering, God is worth worshiping. God is worth clinging to. Above the pain and the hurt, above the fear and the disappointed dreams, God still reigns. And somehow, somehow, God will win. He will establish his kingdom. He will rule in almighty power. And God will somehow take all of this that we experience, joy and pain, fulfillment and disappointment, everything we experience, and make all of this have meaning and all of this have purpose. God's name alone is exalted. And this morning, you may have noticed we're going to do several psalms. We're going to have several psalms in our worship. We're going to focus on psalms that assert God's magnificence. Not necessarily worshiping the God who steps in to dissolve our difficult circumstances, but the God who is to be worshiped and the God who is to be respected because he alone is God. And we began this morning with Psalm 148, an anthem of praise that goes from the highest heights to the deepest depths praise the lord because his name alone is exalted and by the way in the psalms that we read today the idea of raising up a horn will come up occasionally a horn is a symbol of strength it's like the horns of a wild ox or maybe a cape buffalo the most dangerous game animal on earth when he throws his horns up to gore or to shatter the bones of his attackers, you know real power. And to raise a horn then is to establish strength or even to effect a rescue. 
And so you have in this psalm, down in verse 14, he has raised up for his people a horn. And he probably means by that the king as a symbol of God's strength, who is a source of, of rescue and power for the people. But we, of course, think of Jesus, who is our redeemer and our strength and our rescuer. Would you stand, please? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And he has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. The Lord reigns. Even, even when the floods come, and floods are some of the most powerful, uncontrollable things on earth. You may have been watching the news over the past day or two as floods have, have struck in, in the Carolinas. In the, in the NIV translation of Psalm 93, they're called the seas, but the word is floods. Floods are never constructive. They're only destructive, churning, eroding, moving. If you've ever seen a flood in a river like I have, you see houses floating downstream. You see huge trees uprooted and come floating downstream. Huge boulders are rolling along in the surge. And when the floods recede, there is only chaos. Broken sticks and houses in kindling and trees uprooted. And the stench is everywhere. There is nothing constructive, nothing good that ever comes out of a flood. And the psalmist says the floods have raised themselves up against God, but God has established his world by his statutes. This far and no farther. And the implication is the only way to keep your balance, the only way to survive, even in the middle of chaos that just shreds everything around you, the only way to maintain your footing is to abide in the statutes of the Lord. These, these principles of faith and, and principles of obedience that God has firmly set in place. In Hebrew, the word probably should be translated testimonies. Uh, the idea of the testimony was a legal document, a sort of contract of conduct. This is what the king will do. This is what his people will do. And in a sense, these statutes are not just binding on us, but they're binding on God as well. We can trust God. We can adhere to God because he is worthy of our trust. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Psalm 46 establishes God's ascendancy over nature over attackers, over the whole warring, warring world. And note the contrast between verses 2 and 3, which we'll be reading here in just a moment. Though the earth give way 
and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Notice that contrast now with verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. All around is chaos, except where God is. And I don't think the psalmist means to say, you know, out there is chaos, and here is the eye of the storm, and everything is calm. I think what he means to say is, you are experiencing chaos. But in the middle of this chaos, God is pure support. He is a firm place to stand. He is the one who gives you power to endure. The night was growing darker. The leaders were lurking in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to destroy him. His own friend, maybe his closest friend, tiptoes out into the dark to betray him. He is mocked, spit upon, beaten, and crucified. And in the middle of that chaos, in the middle of that darkness, in the middle of that defeat, God reigns. Above his head, they place the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And three days later, the disciples scatter into Jerusalem to announce, He's risen! Jesus is the sign of God's kingdom, God's reign. He is the banner. He is kind of the star-spangled banner of God's reign in the middle of chaos. He is... He is the guarantee of life. Even when all hope ought to be gone, he is the proof of the truth of this psalm. And I want you to stand and read this psalm with me. You are all, I am leader. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among, among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Be seated. There is a grand human dignity about us. Something that says, I can make it the way that it ought to be. If I am just in control, if I can just somehow get hold of things, Everything will work out fine. Even if chaos breaks loose, even if hell manages to invade our lives, I can fix it by my wise, if somewhat frenzied activity, with hard work, persistence, calmness, technique. And you know, we can bend everything. Our hearts, our people. You know, we, can make our, we can force our children to be what we want them to be. We can force our spouses to be what we want them to be. We can force our coworkers to be just exactly the right people. We can force our circumstances to be what we want them to be. I can whip this, we say. And so we flex our muscles. We, in the terms of the Psalms, we raise our horns. Have you noticed, though, that incredibly enough, it's not the difficult times that destroy us. It is in difficulty, it seems, that our sight gets sharper. Our hearts grow purer. Our determination and even our hope is more solid than ever. It's when things go well, 
when we're comfortable, when we're sure of ourselves, that we loosen up and we think there are no rules. When we think, I caused all of this, I don't know how, not sure exactly what I did, but I know I did something. And there are no limits. There's no end to the good that I have managed to construct out of my strength, out of my smarts, out of my discipline. And we are blind to the reality that it is the stability of God's judgments. It is the stability of the decisions of God, the the purpose of God, the will of God that gives us strength. We praise you, God. We praise you for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift up your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob who says, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Evil days do come. How will we face them? It is not as though we just smile and shrug and go right on. Rather, we cry, we hurt, we agonize, we struggle. Always, though, with our eyes on the Lord who ultimately will redeem us. I think it's important to understand that word redeem. Redeem does not simply mean to make things better. Redeem means to take something bad and make it into something good, to buy something out of a situation it's in and make it better. It is buying a person out of slavery and placing them in freedom. It is changing circumstances, not just changing them in some small way, but massively changing circumstances to be a glory to God. There is, I suppose, something about this psalm that we're going to read, 49. Something depressing about this psalm, if you really pay attention to it. Because the psalm is about how life is so uncertain. It's about how life is so chaotic that we will do just about anything to find relief. We have to buy our way to security and to happiness. And that's really what the pursuit of money and status and power is all about isn't it i'll be famous and then i will really be worth something i will be powerful and then what i do will count and nobody can tear it down i will be rich and nothing will cost too much for me to afford and then you die and what then Your famous name is inscribed on a tombstone. And even that tends to rot away with time. Death mocks your power and underscores your helplessness and your weakness. You go to your inner room and open your safe and moths gorged on your wealth are barely able to flit away. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The meditation of my heart will give you understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb with the harp. I will expound my riddle. 
Why should I fear when evil days come? When wicked deceivers surround me, those who put their trust or put trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that the wise die, that the foolish and the senseless also perish, leaving their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. People, despite their wealth, did not endure. They are like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. They are like sheep and are destined to die. Death will be their shepherd, but the upright will prevail over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave far from the princely mansions, but God will redeem me from the realm of the dead. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases, for they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them, though while they live they count themselves blessed, and people praise you when you prosper. They will join those who have gone before them, who will never again see the light of life. People who have wealth but lack understanding are like beasts that perish. It all falls out in the end. Rich and poor, healthy and unhealthy, those who have suffered and those who have not. God reigns in the power of his justice. God is, or Jesus is talking to people who are going to suffer for their faith. And they're going to die horrible deaths in order to say, I believe in Jesus. What good will it be, he says? For someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Jesus, talking to Peter, said, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then almost inconceivably, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. out of his control, at the mercy of his enemies, a prisoner to circumstances, Jesus said. Does that make it easy? No. But I think Peter would say, Jesus makes it worth it. We, we come to a point in our service where we always have an invitation. We invite you to think about your life and to consider your hearts. A place in worship where you can say, I will commit myself to Jesus. And it's your time. If, if, if you want to confess the name of Christ, if you want to be baptized, the Holy Spirit will move in you. Jesus will be glorified. It is your time to repent of your sin and to renew your relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. The psalmist said, be wise. And that's what my appeal is this morning. Be wise. And would you come? Let's sing.